Hi and welcome to Matrix Moments. This is Saloni and joining us today on this episode is a very special guest, Harsh Jain, the CEO and co-founder of one of India's most prominent and most valuable fantasy sports platform and a company that truly doesn't need any introduction, Dream 11. Harsh is in conversation with Arun Davda, managing director at Matrix Partners India. Through the course of this episode, they talk about the Indian gaming industry and its evolution over the past decade. the key inflection points in dream 11's journey harsh's personal growth journey as a leader his relationship with his co-founder bhavit shet who incidentally has been his friend since they were 7 years old and why culture plays such a large role at dream 11 this conversation wouldn't have been complete without talking about dream 11 winning the ipl title sponsorship a huge milestone for harsh personally and professionally we cover all of this and more tune in Welcome to another episode of Matrix Moments. Uh, I have a very, very special guest on our podcast today. Uh, this is a founder who epitomizes the word persistence. I think his uh, he started off in two thousand eight, if I remember correctly, and it's only in twenty twenty that people have realized that uh, Dream Eleven is an overnight success. And so, you know, Harsh is going to talk all about that. Harsh, thank you so much for joining the show. Oh, thanks for having me. uh get to be here and share what little wisdom i have <laughs> with no no i i really young entrepreneurs I, yeah no this is this is actually really helpful uh, harsh and you know i think your journey especially because i think if there's one entrepreneur who had all the odds stacked against him when he started off in terms of the domain in terms of you know lack of a category in which you were building the company in terms of all the headwinds that one could expect on a funding front or on a regulatory front i think you fought them all and so it would be great to actually you know just maybe retrace their journey a little bit and share any sort of uh, you know uh, experiences that you think can help uh, people listening in uh, but i'm actually going to start with with a you know a really interesting episode that i had personally experienced with you and also a tweet storm that i remember uh, there was somebody who had wrote, uh, written about this and it's it's come, somehow stuck with me right so this was a tweet storm that i had read uh, that vishal mishra who's a columbia professor had put out about you uh, where uh, this was i think back i don't you know probably like early 2000 like 10 11 12 i don't know which what time it was yeah. but you you were uh, a, a student back then and had basically reached out to vishal for uh, help and um, you know he started basically this was right around the time you were probably still trying to figure things out at dream 11 and figure out the exact model and the exact product and stuff of like that and i remember it was like the way he described it it, it was you all were in touch for the longest time and uh, he didn't know until uh, much later uh, your family background right um, and i'll tell you why i'm starting with this because i had a different sort of personal episode where I was fortunate to listen to you talking about your entrepreneurial journey uh, at one of the EO forums, and I remember something that you said. Or it was maybe someone in the audience that really stuck with me. Where, you know, there was a time where, you know, Dream Eleven was doing really well, and you kept sort of, you know, going from strength to strength. Uh, you know, raising lots of capital, valuation was going up, revenue was going up. You know, our Dream Eleven had become a household name, but there were still people who would. tell you that hey why don't you go and join join your dad's business right and you were mm. still known as anand jain's son and i think your father made this statement which i think must have made you really proud where today he meets people and they say oh you're harsh jain's father no. right <laughs> and so it's been it's been it's, it's been a little bit of a i think a 360 degree turn for you so firstly congratulations on such a fantastic journey but uh, you know tell us a little bit about those early days yeah i you know fantasy wasn't something that anyone understood back then in the early 2010s uh you know f- starting from there how did you iterate on the model uh what was what was it that was just driving you uh, back then when nobody un- understood what you were doing i think um like deep rooted passion for the problem that we are trying to solve right and um, a little bit of stubbornness of not accepting failure right and uh, hopefully learning from all the failures that we continuously have um 
that i think combined with the fact that look i was i am i am like fortunate enough to have a very large cushion to fall back on so it wasn't like uh, okay if this fails and i don't know what i'll do i don't know where i'll go i started very young i started at 22 that yeah. helped a lot right and i keep telling people like please push your kids from college into entrepreneurship if they have if they're open to it <clears throat> any kind of entrepreneurship just push them into it um please encourage them because the amount you learn that time with the opportunity cost is so low right it's like you can fail for years and it's okay at 25 yeah. you can take up a serious job right yeah but 3 4 years you can spend like trying different things you know trying the entrepreneurial route but i think that was a combination of all that right so at 2008 when um, i mean the I, the whole idea to do fantasy cricket for ipl was because i'm such a big fantasy epl fan yeah my target literally is every year to place in the top in the like 99.99th percentile of epl fantasy players worldwide and so like i'm like a fanatic for fantasy epl and um, i was just shocked that in a country with a billion sports fans in the us and over 70% of online sports fans have played fantasy sports yeah and in a country with like today almost you know 500 million plus online sports fans hmm and even that time there were like over 100 100 million like kind of online sports fans correct there was no fantasy sports at all and so it was a very personal problem that i went to solve and that's i think that helps a lot because if it's if it's some new cool trend that you're chasing right the minute you hit obstacles earlier on i think most up. people will just give up yeah and i think that's very important for founders to get into areas where they are so personally personally vested and passionate about that they just won't give up for like 5 years right i think 5 years i've seen becomes a key inflection point honestly i think most businesses take 5 years to like find their way pivot More find way, yeah. kind of like you know keep keep changing keep pivoting and then i think I, after 5 years if you haven't found something that you're ready to scale yeah then i then i agree that you know entrepreneurs should look elsewhere right you shouldn't be so stubborn mm-hmm. also to know that okay nahi chal raha fir bhi karte jaunga right correct correct but giving up in 2 3 years also i think is a big mistake that many people make if you have mm-hmm. the wherewithal to continue right and so that persistence does help the persistence and that stubbornness does help to continue chasing let me ask you an honest question right yeah. somewhere at the back of uh, every investor's mind when they met you back then yeah. you know there's this bias that investors fight which is they want to see entrepreneurs that they are backing be all in so yeah, to speak yeah, obviously right and, and you you said that you don't have that you know it it wasn't that you know if this didn't work out you know your life would be over right you you had okay. enough of a cushion okay. uh how much of that bias you think played into the early days of fundraising experience there was definitely that bias that was there in people's minds that okay you know if this doesn't work out for you you'll just because again like you said there's a very tough tough industry right legality yeah. regulations even banks wouldn't let us open a banking account with them right forget forget the normal legality and regulation right. they didn't open a banking account for our company mm. uh getting a bank account we had to like ask seven banks and like call people and be like okay we'll get this opinion that opinion then they let us open one bank account wow opening a bank account was a celebration right ki theek hai we got a bank account we're in business right this sounds like eerily familiar to the story of like infosys and a bunch of others right where they struggled to get a telephone line back in the day yeah yeah different different just different uh different disruptions and different eras right um, but yeah. yeah see similar challenges look for me it wasn't about um creating something nice mm. for me the bar was much higher right i had to create something great Yes because like you said like you've heard me speak before about this that if i created something nice something good it would always be treated as like a side job right like ki theek hai it's like a okay wo series ab chala ke wo theek hai chal raha hai unless yeah unless we became that you know i don't really like to talk about valuations ever 
but unless i would achieve something that can become a unicorn and more yes people would con- continuously question that oh why don't you join your family it's, he's like it's like a hobby that he's doing on the side yeah correct so so we you know you i think investors also have to look into like what's what's driving this person right what are the motivations and yeah correct and i think that um, for me a lot of investors had to say, would would have said no right because of the fact that a they weren't sure that i would continue fighting that fight because it would be a big long fight and uh, b is that if i don't end up creating something like which goes towards a unicorn will this founder get up and like quit and say like okay let's Just professionally manage this or something then you will never get your vc loans correct correct and so i don't i don't blame anyone i don't have any um, any bad feelings or anything for the people if i was in most on most investors issues out of thought the same way after hearing 115 noses some some report i was just reading or yeah. some news article lost count and, after and, like and, a and, and, and infamously infamously i think matrix was one of those noses uh which in hindsight obviously looked extremely stupid but uh, it's okay you were in some you were in some very good company though <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so was there self doubt any at any time i mean the passion is fine right but at some point when you hear 150 people tell you hey this isn't going to work we we're not going to back this there's a lot of legal sort of regulatory kind of mess that uh, there is was there ever self doubt how do you deal with that yeah look we're talking about like 2008 starting and 2015 getting funded yes massive self doubt wow. and like you know massive self doubt for years right um but then find luckily enough we kept pivoting just to have that every year where we would be like okay chalo if this year doesn't work maybe we should drop it right after like 3 4 years so every year that 2000 like for example 2008 9 10 we spent we burnt like 70% of our friends and family seed money that we had raised we burnt 70% of it in one year wow and then we survived on like 10% of it for the next year and then we said okay now we have only like 20% left now uh, or we survived with 20% do we, do? Yeah. we had only 10% left so then we yeah. started a services agency we made money from there so 2010 11 12 we were actually running a services agency so if you ask me wow. what i do in 2010 11 i would say i'm the ceo of red digital and then if you really asked me Amazing. like oh but what happened what happened to that other thing fantasy i'd be like ha wo ek chota passion project hai side pe dream 11 <laughs> so we went from a 40 people company on dream 11 in 2008 and 9 yeah to eight people company on dream 11 and 32 people on the servicing side wow and the 32 people became like 60 people on servicing and those eight people became like six people on the product so when did you know it's working like when did you feel that okay you know what the services thing was a distraction it's out i know no, this is working like when always, what was that moment me i wasn't i am never i've never been made for like that servicing business right i just i'm a more of a product person so yeah. the servicing part was just a means to an end it got us the cash flows and it allowed me to continue being stubborn about not going back to my dad and saying you are right right yeah for <laughs> money and uh, oh i need to shut it down right so i was like no no we're fine we're fine we're, we're managing we've done this cool thing on the side and he was like okay <clears throat> he's also learning right so um so at that time we were like okay dreamland doesn't work so we just kept pivoting kept pivoting kept trying everything then in 2012 we pivoted okay. to what you see today and okay. then by 2013 we saw that by you know that year we saw for the first time organic users all our growth was only organic we weren't spending money marketing so yeah. organic users coming back you know that viral coefficient kicking in over one going to high twos kind of thing every new user would invite two friends we would ask users where they came from they would always say like friends and family friends and family like reference Somebody- friends we, we saw, saw that word of mouth sort of kicking in correct and the most important thing which i think i think a lot of people like it's um, they don't give enough importance to is retention every time it's a leaky bucket 100 1 million come 900000 950000 of them leave 
so my point is that retention when you see retention kicking in hmm. Hmm. organic retention non incentivized retention very important because again incentivized retention very easy yo i'll take vc money i'll give you that vc money and you come back and play with it correct then that's all incentivized retention and then you start creating all these cool jargon of like cm1 and cm2 and cm3 and cm3 you know yeah. <laughs> cool contribution ways to show that contribution margin is positive with some like you know uh, so i'm just full disclaimers yeah, attached to it utna that marwadi genetics have come down in me where i've been trained that ek to contribution margin hai ek bidda hai there's no cm1 Correct. cm2 cm3 right there's nothing else in the middle you're either negative or you're positive yeah so, so i think that when we saw that retention was high organic retention non incentivized retention and virality was there yeah that's when i think that's what we call product market fit and when we saw that happening we could project our business project revenues because of which we said that okay now it's time to shut the services business and put all that money that we get from selling that into the mm. product side and continuing you know one other thing that you've told me over time which i again found very unique uh, and honestly i've not heard tony founders even track this metric which is net revenue per employee yeah right and i remember you have told me that uh, i mean you've broken a lot of uh, you know rules along the way right you built a tech company from bombay uh, which most other people have migrated out of bombay and you know said hey you can't get tech talent here and i remember you telling me that you know what your you knew that i need one of a couple of hundred people to yeah. build this into a large company and each employee should generate a million dollars in net revenue for me right i think some i think somewhere it was broadly this maybe the numbers are slightly off but i remember you telling me 200 employees and 200 million dollars of net revenue right and how did you like what were the early i guess like were the mentors that were you know because you are a first time founder right like who was guiding you with this stuff so one is to the like i said the good old like marwadi business genes right that ki dhanda banana hai right you're yeah. not you're like you like i've never grown up with the concept of losing money right <laughs> of burning money yeah like, that's an acquired <laughs> acquired taste acquired right? skill yeah <laughs> acquired skill after like going through <laughs> venture capital fundraising right and i used to read like crazy about us businesses so i used to read a, like a lot about uh, you know your paypal and your you know peter thiel and growth hackers and airbnb mm. and uh, facebook and you know google and all of them right i used to read like like i literally would read everything there was to read and my favorite site at that time was growthhackers.com and that yeah. kind of really taught you that you can burn money but there has to be a method to the madness yeah like your contribution margins have to be positive has to be positive your unit economics have to be solid only then can you burn money even that you have to project at which point yes you will burn money till and it taught me those lessons about saying that okay you can burn money but every time you raise money it should only have a 12 month burn mm. and your next and your business should survive no more fundraising ever after and i think that's the one principle we kind of always stayed with we would only raise the amount of money that we could burn in one year after mm. which we assume we won't get funded again wow so and so in your mind it was always in 12 months i need to become correct. profitable correct it has to be break even and then moving to profitability after 12 months because kal hona ho kind of thing right like uh, you know funding aayega nahi aayega we can't have a business that's dependable on funding funding for us was very clearly always a catalyst for growth to grow accelerate our growth but not sustenance right hmm. and again we are fortunate enough to be in an industry where we weren't fighting some large giant like let's say an ola uber right i mean what do you do if i'm if i'm bhavish and travis is on my neck and you know throwing a billion dollars what do you do you have to just yeah. go into that yeah. you just have yeah. to go into it right No, I remember, and you know, you you mentioned Bhavesh, and obviously we've been close to their journey. Yeah. And I remember two different occasions where, you know, Bhavesh said that, you know what, 
I am ahead in market share and I want to take the business to a point where for every dollar that the, the competitor burns, I need to burn 20 or 25 cents to maintain my lead in the market right. share. Right now, I don't think one can say if they're doing a dollar, I'll spend like zero, right? I, yeah, at the end of exactly. the day, there is, there exactly. is a market dynamic to it, exactly. but, but to have that clarity saying that, you know what, I will be four X or five X more efficient in yeah. every spend than my competitor. And eventually that's going to, that will cause them to slow down because they know if they're spending five X more than us, right. and are still not able to kind of, you know, take a lead on us. That makes a big difference. And the second is exactly this, which is, you know, whose game are you playing? With a lot of the, the you know these global companies that have profit pools outside India, for them to use that profit and divert some of it to the Indian market is much easier than a young founder whose metrics are still to be proven out to constantly raise venture capital, constantly go dilute themselves and invest that in fighting. I mean, it's 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 just a battle that you know beyond a point you're starting off at a disadvantage. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. So I'm going to segue into a. Uh, a different topic, which I think is is very very timely and very contextual. So I see the T-shirt you're wearing. Uh, uh, there's it's a, a there's a, it's not planned. I just yes. Mumbai <laughs> and Manchester United win the day before. You will see me wearing yeah. those T-shirts that day or the next day. Yeah. No. So you know, I think it's a it's a big moment, right? And all of us feel extreme pride. Uh, to see a venture funded company, which is sort of actually been built, you know, in front of eyes, um, actually become the title sponsor of the largest sporting event in the country and possibly amongst the largest in the world, right? Uh, beyond all the headlines, right? And uh, what does this, like when you, when you are sort of, when your laptop is off, your phone is away, when you're about to sleep at night, what's the thought that comes to your mind saying, you know, what does this mean to you? First of all, uh, that's right. My laptop is off. My phone is never off. But <laughs> but um, when I'm sleeping at night, also like I would say, like half the times I'm dreaming about something about some work stuff is going on. In fact, I am now trying to actually have a little more like balance as as the company scales because it's an entrepreneur. You're just you're just never off, right? You cannot be off. I think every entrepreneur, every CEO, every CX in the country today and in all parts of the world is going to sleep thinking about like regulatory issues many times, right? Those are always on top of everyone's minds, like regulatory clear, clarity, tuck the business, you know, just clarity on like, thik, thik hai. I can just focus on my business and carry on and this is the playbook, right? I think yeah. everywhere on the world, those are, that's becoming a large issue. Let me ask you another question. There's been a, you spoke about regulatory, right? And there's been a lot of noise recently about sort of this whole app store ecosystem. Yeah. Um, Dream 11, which is by every court of law in India uh, declared as a sort of legal business model. Uh, yeah. The app store for various reasons doesn't allow these uh, apps to be distributed on the app store. Yeah, the and I think you're one of the, probably the, the rare outliers that has managed to generate more than hundred million downloads outside of the app store. And I'm sure that was a massive deterrent again, when it came to fundraising, because people are like, Hey, who's going to discover you? Like, are people going to go and download something from some, you know, website where there are multiple security warnings that the, uh, the OS will give you, uh, saying that, Hey, this, this app, app is not safe. Are you sure you're downloading? This app might have some viruses. Exactly. This app might kill you. Exactly. Do you want to install it exactly. anyways? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. Exactly. Right. So, so, how, how, like, what is your take on this whole thing? Like, what, what, what's our way out? Uh, Dream yeah. 11 has been arguing with Google Play policy for like five, six years. The whole ecosystem has woken up to it now, right? Because of some new policies they put. But we've been arguing this for like, since our inception, right? That why are we not allowed on the Play Store? In fact, it's gotten to a point where the court in one of our, you know, Supreme Court hearings, has mm-hmm. said that Dream 11 is a game of skill. This matter cannot be argued in court again because it was the third time the judges had to like uh, look at the listen to the matter. And mm-hmm. we were just like, you know, the this will keep going on and on. Are we going to just keep wasting court time? And so they've actually said in a judgment that Dream 11, this, this point is not to be, should not be heard argued again. again about their game of skill. And still we have people filing, right? Um, but secondly, it also said that dream 11 is protected as under the constitution, article 191 G of India, 
the constitution of india it's a constitutional right to run dream 11's business as a regular business activity okay the only person in india who can decide legality is a court correct so if the supreme court of india said this then you are allowed on the app store so we are available on the app store google play store has its own policy <clears throat> and the request we've been making to the play store for many years now is that you cannot supersede the, the supreme, supreme court, court of india. india and the constitution of india for indian users you cannot have a policy which supersedes that and so we've been requesting them that all you need to do is follow the law of the land mm. if it's not proven legal like i know you know many things are not proven legal they're just like legal opinions Correct. then okay then don't don't open that if you don't want but what is proven legal legal and is constitutional protection how can you say i will not allow 95% of india to have access to it and what what have like it's clearly fallen on deaf ears because it's not changed yet so yeah, like, what so, have, what have what have you all heard so till now we were the only ones fighting it for 5 6 years so you know now now there's strength in numbers and so hopefully uh, google policy see i also don't blame google india too much right like google india the indian arm of the of yeah. google globally mm. did not have the say because google policy was controlled by in, in the us globally and so they always they don't have the ability to to say that there needs to be a google policy india team which needs to just mm. look at google policy in india and so because our issue wasn't too common mm. it wasn't a big enough matter now that this has become a ecosystem issue i am sure that they'll have people dedicated to india policy very soon and they will carve out fantasy sports and other you know yeah. correct all the policy problems in india now so good look i'm happy yeah. strength in numbers now i find it ironic that you know uh a company which has had which has been tested which business model has been tested by you know the 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 highest authority in the country uh, from a legal perspective you know is still not able to convince like you can imagine what some of the smaller companies and smaller yeah. uh, early stage founders must be going through so that's why we also at least for our industry we said that look all the problems and issues we went through let's at least help the ecosystem to grow with us right and so we created an industry body called the federation of indian fantasy sports and then we professionalized it we institutionalized it right so we are now like a board member mm. founder member but obviously there's there's like other operators other members as well now there's an ex supreme court justice there's an ex police mm. commissioner there's someone from the ministry of sports and youth affairs there's the ex gm of bcci there's the ex legal head of uh, img and um it's headed by an independent ceo and his team and so it's like a full federation body that has 35 of the largest fantasy sports companies as members which represent like 99% of users in india wow and then they actually fight for the federation so they fight for the and, entire and, so, and and even this federation hasn't been able to sort of convince google because now it's not just one company right but at least it's a federation are, that represents at least now you can you can you can open as a fantasy sports operator when you yeah, join you the get the payment gateway and the bank and all that payment is. gateway banking uh, advertising on like google facebook all of yes. that becomes 10 times easier okay let me switch gears to the other interesting thing that i have observed about dream 11 in the last 6 months so this is march 2020 and uh, all sport i mean the country is under lockdown all sporting events have been shut down ipl has been postponed which is probably the biggest sort of moment for you guys uh yeah. and there's just actually no sporting events happening across the country not even small league matches or anything right uh yeah. and dream 11 was highly highly dependent on cricket as a source of revenue right yeah all, uh, yeah, all sports all sports were off worldwide correct correct right uh how did you guys recover from that because i i know you're one of the few companies that saw almost a v shaped recovery uh, yeah. very very quickly 
So I think here's where that funding part also plays a role, right? Um, it gives you the ability to sustain and to go on in these tough times. Cash is very important to have in the bank for all companies. You can't be living off scraps, right? And then yeah. <clears throat> you also have to run, create businesses which have a good margin so that you have some cushion, right? And it doesn't, yeah. if you have that 1% margin business, then the minute anything goes wrong, it's just gone, right? It's, You're going to wipe out. Your costs are come too high. So as a business that had huge amount of, uh, like we saw, I think 90% of our costs were variable. And that is one of the key parts, right? Like most of it being marketing. Correct. So the day spots went out, marketing went out the next day. Turn the marketing tap off, yeah. 80% of our expenses gone overnight, right? Then all our partner agreements, all of that, everything suspended as a force mayor, right? And using force majeure, which everyone agreed to, all the partners agreed to, everyone knew it. Yeah. We were able to bring down our cost to like only 10%. Which was basically salaries and rent. And this was despite you guys actually being fairly well capitalized. This wasn't like yeah. something where you were running out of cash and this Correct. was the only thing you could do. No, because I mean, that's the first thing you do. And then, then you say, okay, now, now this is my cost. Now let's assume mm. sports don't come back for one year. How long can we survive on the money we have? And Correct. when that answer was more than one year. <clears throat> That we can just survive more than one year easily. We said, okay, then let's not worry. Yeah. And forget about it, right? Then there's no need to jump into some random new new thing to do and pivot into something to make money right now. If we are confident that in the next six months spots will come back, and like supremely confident in the next one year spots will come back. Mm. And let's just stick to what we do and take this time to wipe out product tech debt that every company carries with it for years and years and years. Great point. And so our team was more than happy with that. And so they were like very happy that, okay, you know, do many kill it, team many kill it, we'll get a chance to wipe out. So They're actually fixing the stuff that you always wanted to do, but never got around to doing it. So we told the teams take two months now and only go into debt mode and sports came back way sooner than we thought. And even in those three months, we actually had this Tajikistan basketball, Nicaraguan football, we scoured the globe and found these. Yeah, I, 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 and, and none of these were on Dream 11 earlier, right? No, no, none of these were. Like, ever. So, so, what made, what, so, yeah, so what gave you the belief that it would work? Like, like what's, what's the how cost? do you even think of it? What's the cost? There's no cost to it. Just, yeah. it's a digital product, right? So, <clears throat> they are playing anyways with or without us. We just had to get the XML feeds. And sign up with the tournaments and then we started, right? So the cost is minimal to start and try it out. If it works good, if it doesn't work, we'll stop it. And what do you learn about your user <laughs> through this experience? Because at least no, my, my, my sort of been that they're doing this for the love of cricket. Right? Yeah, no, but the, clearly that's, that's proven to be no, not correct. Sports fans, sports fans dying of boredom at home will consume whatever sports you throw at them, right? If it means finding out about, you know, learning about Nicaraguan football and Belarus football and the Jakistan basketball, they'll pick it up because they need something at home. They were like crazily bored, no sports. And so that, you know, hardcore sports fans. And so we really Sounds learned. That, um, and, you know, that's also very interesting because the minute sports started coming back, the same contests and the same matches that were doing well in the lockdown, Plummeted. Oh. So it wasn't like they were, they loved Nicaraguan football or Tajikistan basketball. They were, they love sports. So in the lack of So sports, they were making do with that in the lack of They were making do, but the minute anything came back, they all, they all pivoted again to the main Yeah. So yeah, so we so were today, able to survive and thrive during during this time because of our ability to also experiment and pivot and continuously, you know, you have to create that culture in the company. And that's what I keep talking about, culture, 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 right? You have to let people experiment. You have to delegate. You have to get out of micromanagement. You have to create a culture where people can experiment without the fear of failure. You have to celebrate failures, celebrate, you know, focus on learnings. And that's the only way to succeed. 
you have to create that culture where you encourage people go have the guts to try it out and if you fail we will come and celebrate it right but just don't fail on the same thing again and again right because then that's stupidity so that's a very again interesting segue and you know one of the things that has always struck me you know right from what you had said about you know 200 employees 200 million dollars in net revenue and you know all of these are very early signs of just top down thinking around how you want to build an organization right and obviously culture has a big role to play in that uh, and i've been fortunate to have walked around your office the new one and you know it it really gives you a fantastic vibe right and obviously office you know the way the office is set up is just one small part of culture right what is culture for you and when did you as a founder start thinking of it as something that is important as you sort of build and scale this company i think um i would honestly say somewhere after we got funded maybe around the series b when okay. we started growing growing to beyond 50 people hmm you know you you start seeing that the new people coming in who've been here for a few months are not as culturally aligned see when you're when you're like 30 40 people or lower than that everyone manage, is yeah. culturally aligned because because you're like talking right. to each person on a daily basis yes so whatever your culture is it is ingrained heavily and in your early stages most people have been with you for a while right hmm you're not like recruiting like a, a super huge pace and all of that so they've had years to spend with the founder or founders and that culture is set then when you start scaling up you start seeing that you know it's a it's a studied fact that when you every time you triple up every mm. your your anything your base everything will break yes so we were at like 15 20 people and i saw this happening at like 50 60 people our culture broke our systems broke all of it broke so then you have to go and you have to write. so then we went and wrote down our culture we rewrote it actually yeah. we wrote it wrote it down no we never had it in writing before that because it was a understood thing yeah 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 correct so then we wrote it down and then when we went from 50 people to 150 people again all the systems broke because now the way we were still running when we were like 100 people was still like micromanagement right yes all decisions were taken by me or bhavit my co-founder and so once you cross that 100 150 people you can't you have to have cx was taking the decisions so everything yes. broke again now at 150 we grew to like 450 500 people now we're just growing and now everything's breaking again so it's not something that you can put down and just let it go you have to adapt you have to change the entire org structure the systems the processes to continuously evolve and i think the hardest thing for someone like me who's a very like hands on founder right is to like like leave leave the yeah. steering wheel right correct and step back and say ki theek hai you know you can go i can see that you're driving into a little bit of an accident right Yeah but go as long as you don't drive off a cliff go bang into that car see that you made a yeah. mistake or prove that work. i was wrong right yeah and one of us will learn and then we'll carry on but you know that's i think that's one of the toughest parts of a founder to let go of the steering wheel because you built it with like your you know blood sweat and tears for so long that you're so scared that someone else is going to drive that car off the cliff yeah So you know what you said is really interesting. Let me ask you this question: uh, Your co-founder Bhavit is, and your relationship with him is less spoken about, right? Yeah. Uh, if I were to ask Bhavit to describe your leadership style in 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 three words, what, what, like what words would you use? We both agree. <laughs> No, but like, like you said, it's hard to let go. I, I need to be involved. Like, are you, yeah. are you a micromanager by, by, by this thing? Like, what would you? Yeah, so I would say it's, it's definitely a evolution for me as a founder CEO. Um, I'm very hands on, right? Very hands on. I, I'm a task manager. I like all my stuff in organized way. Like, we use Monday dot com. I don't know if you used it yeah. or heard of it. Yeah, yeah. And if have you always been like super organized as a person? 
Ah, I've been I've I've had a lot of OCD always, right? Like I keep my remotes on my bedside in a line, and like you know my clothes are like you know proper way in the cupboard, and I've always had that OCD part. And um, I think Bharat and I, being school friends, knowing each other since you we were like seven eight years old, right? And being in the same group of friends, that is something that I think even investors. For sure. Like should really treasure in any kind of company. Absolutely. Yeah, because yeah, I think yeah. there's some crazy stat like forty percent of businesses fail because the founders fall apart, right? Correct. Correct. And I think that understanding, if you can have from before, solves so many problems. So much. And if there's clear understanding between founders of who's taking the call in what areas, I think that's very important. So it's very clear. Like Bhavit is a COO and I'm the CEO. these are the things he handles these are the things i handle and it's very clear and we both keep we both keep having open arguments with each other open debates about the other one's opinion but finally you know who's taking the call you can disagree and commit correct right so you can argue all you want but finally when a call is taken you disagree and commit if you were to look back on the dream 11 journey and talk about one or two key inflection points for the company um and it could be something that you already spoken about or something that you know you haven't shared earlier like what were those two like one or two key inflection points for the company so i think um one was definitely raising a round of funding right our first the first one yeah after like two years of going across india across bombay bangalore delhi um uh new york um obviously the valley and sandal road and up and down doing everything finally raising our first round of funding after like going to the ic with a bunch of uh, vcs twice twice or thrice we went to an ic and ic for all the other founders on the call is basically your last you know final investment committee your last sign up your last approval before you can get that term sheet and yeah. failing there right uh getting that first round of funding is always special because you know even with the family money put in then they can be like okay someone else is either as smart as i am or as stupid yeah. as i am to put the money right <laughs> but they like misery loves company right and yeah. so okay there's someone else who's believing in their own money to put in not just family and friends right yeah so that's very important i think the second biggest inflection point was that um getting judicial clearance yeah so one is having legal opinions that your business is okay is is a regular business is a game of skill clearly it it's the same as it is globally and it is not gambling and betting and all these things and the other thing is to get a court judgment about oh, yeah whether indian judicial system a high court and a supreme court in writing are saying that yes that's true right that that had a huge impact on our business um and i would say yeah those are the two big ones of course now dream 11 ipl but that's more recent right now yeah but those two are no, like by far that's a special the, moment those two are by far those big big uh, catalytic events kind of thing again as a i want to just double click on the part where you mentioned about the judicial sort of uh, clarity Yeah. First time founder, young founder, obviously very little exposure to legal systems, regulatory systems in this country. Yeah. Uh, you're juggling fundraising. You're juggling still, still hiring. Very, still very, very <laughs> like I have no idea what's going on. Experience, <laughs> correct. But you're juggling on the one hand fundraising. You're juggling hiring people, getting a team in place. You're hiring, building a product. You're hiring, getting you know the 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 some sort of. customer traction and you know sort of stuff for like that how much time like how did you like is this something that was front and center for you like i need to get this like for you was the judicial clarity yeah. was that your yeah. core agenda and saying i this yeah, i own for, this for, for, for many years we said that okay we need like judicial clearance if you really want to progress and you know go faster and you know there might be a vc here and there who agree to fund us without that but the real you know the real ability to talk to like 20 vcs or pe's tomorrow yes. depend on that right 
once their clarity is up. And um, that was front and center. For years, we said that, should we just go to court? But then once we, we asked many people, if can we go to court to get this cleared? And they were like, no, the court will not accept it. So then we're like, oh, so so we can't go to court because the court is saying that there's like 10,000 cases ka backlog. So yes. Why are you coming to get a... Um, you know, certificate. Yeah. Certificate. Why should we give you a certificate when yeah. there's no case against you? So basically, you have to wait for someone to file a case against you to get approved, hopefully. And, and so that, that too will take its own due correct. course, I guess, in terms of time. Yeah, but it is what it is, no? So, um, you know, for years, we ran the business cleanly and in good faith. And then one day someone decided to take us to court and then only through that we could actually argue our case and thankfully win it. But you know, through all of this, like you're saying, regulatory, legal, um, running a business, figuring out fundraising, I think there's two things which are most important. One is like co-founders, right? Um, one founder is, I think it's, it's a disaster, right? And most, most VCs also know that, right? Like, correct. You also are su- supremely dependent on this one person as an investor. And secondly, it's just too much. It's a very lonely journey, right? You need to have some friend or com- you know, co-founder who can share that. Yeah. And secondly, and most importantly, I think is the family support. Um, I've been married 10 years now and you know, my wife has been there through every jab, punch, seemingly knockout punches, all of it, right? And she's constantly been there at home saying, it's okay, we'll figure it out. Want you do this, want you do that. She's my, you know, when you say you have to hire a CXO team, right? Before my CXO team, she was my CXO team. Yeah. And so she was my advisor for HR, for, for like anything that I would go to for people issues because I, I'm actually very bad at empathy and all of that, right? I'm more practical and pragmatic. And she is like super high on empathy and that that really helps coming back. And I would come out of all these, she would wait downstairs in the car while I would go up in America and in many of these fundraising pitches, go up, wait there 45 minutes, get a no, come back down. No, didn't work. Okay, let's go to the next one. And she'd be waiting in the car, right? So, so I mean, you have to have a companion, uh, I, you know, where, where I'm getting at is companionship is an extremely critical part in this journey. If you don't have that support behind you, yeah, then it's, you know, hats off to the person who can do it without that support. Cause I, I don't think I would be able to. Yeah. You know, Harsh, you're one of the rare people who actually calls out the, the spouse and you know, their, their uh, co-founder who may not be as, as I guess, publicly recognized. But, um, you know, thank you for doing it. I, I think oh, it just what? underscores I your mean, humility because I, I don't think people, you know, give enough credence to the fact uh, that every founder's journey, you know, no matter how flashy and nice it looks from the outside, just how gut-wrenching it has been over the years and how their families and the co-founders and, you know, the rest of their support system, what role they have to play. Yeah, it's very important. I think that's very important for the ecosystem to learn about that. So it's great that you guys are covering it. No, thank you so much. I, I know we're out of time, but last question from my side and any closing remarks? I know you've said you shared actually a bunch of pearls of wisdom for, you know, young entrepreneurs and, you know, anyone else who's watching this, but any, anything else that you think would be a helpful lesson to take away from your journey? I think, um, yeah, I would say like for all the founders out there, please do not think that your idea is some like amazing idea that every advisor or anyone you want to meet, you will make them sign an NDA and like send them an NDA and say, otherwise I won't share my idea. If the idea is what is so special, then you're already in trouble, right? Yeah. All that matters is execution. And yeah. you know, if the, if, if someone stealing the idea, will mean that you can't execute it, then it's better you give up today only. Even if it was unique when you started, the reality is within 12 months of you starting, there'll be That's like a dozen. Finished, yeah. It's so easy in the Correct. tech ecosystem. So I would just Correct. say that go out. Obviously, you want to protect your idea. If it's a very good idea, you don't want like the whole world to know about it before yeah. you started executing. But go out and meet people, meet good people, get their advice and take every meeting, take that criticism in your stride and work on it. You know, and um, 
and just if you if you think it's a great idea and if you're willing to be passionate about it and if it has a large addressable market just go for it right it's fine let every guy every person you meet every guru come and tell you it's a crap idea okay take all the feedback try to incorporate how what they found crap about it but don't let anyone tell you otherwise take all the criticism but go for it correct i think i think just underscoring the the point which you made which is you know take every or each of these conversations you know while your eventual goal is to fundraise and get a check yeah. but using in each of those meetings as a learning opportunity which i don't think a lot of people do right which is like this is just free feedback from people who yeah. you know potentially may have seen you know several more ideas and several more sorts instances of success or failure just using that as a learning opportunity but obviously at the end of the day as an entrepreneur you need to back your conviction Entre- entrepreneurs going to vcs learn from what they are saying because they have seen 100 companies right you agree or disagree is fine but at least try to learn from them yeah no i think that's a great point harsh uh, i will no no this is this is amazing actually this has been honestly one of the most enjoyable episodes i've done uh, i think every statement you have made is just it just resonates so much and i think that can only come from somebody who has personally seen every twist and turn in the journey that you know one can throw at you right so thank you so much for doing this i think it's 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 just super inspiring to see and you know wish you and dream 11 you know much more success going forward thanks a lot tarun and same wishing you the same and along with your portfolio hope hope all your portfolio companies have that strong v shaped uh jump back agree, yeah Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for tuning in. For more Matrix Moments episodes, you can head to www.matrixpartners.in/blog. You can also follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube for more updates.